السلام علیکم خواتین و حضرات وسیم احسن ویلکم سیو ٹو دا ورچوئل یونیورسٹی آف پاکستان اٹ از لیکچر نمبر ٹوینٹی نائن آف برانڈ مینجمنٹ ایم کے ٹی سکس ٹو فور آئی ایم گوئنگ ٹو کنٹینیو مائی ڈسکشن آن دا چینل مینجمنٹ ایگزیکٹلی فرام ویئر آئی لیفٹ ایٹ ان دا پریویس لیکچر اینڈ وڈ لائک ٹو ڈرا یور اٹینشن ٹو دا گرافک السٹریشن وچ آئی واز ٹاکنگ اباؤٹ ایٹ دا اینڈ آف دا پریویس لیکچر If you take a good look at the illustration, you will see that company Y has a set of mixed channels and also it is selling directly to its customers. Whereas company X is selling directly and while selling directly, it has two different models. Why is it that there is variation between the selling models of two companies? Not only that there are variations between the companies, If you take a look at just one company, it has a set of mixed systems to reach its customers. The one that is selling directly is uh, more likely to make better margins than the one which is selling indirectly. This is what looks apparent. Why is it that um, the companies do not have identical systems? It is a question of historical backgrounds, sets of circumstances, The companies have been surrounded with and initiatives that managements of the two companies decided to take or not take at different points in time. So it is a mixture of all these factors which make a company decide what kinds of channels it is going to have. And it goes without saying that uh, all these factors, the meaning, the historical background, uh, the initiatives with which the managements of the company or the companies could have been taking or not have been taking, um, and uh, the circumstances the companies have been surrounded by, all are impacted by the three strategic factors that we discussed in the previous lecture. And those three factors are uh, the profitability, the sales revenues, and product-market relationship, meaning whether it is a consumer consumable or a consumer durable or any other type of product that you are selling in the market. What is important is to see that all these factors have got to be viewed in a way that they improve the performance of the company. And the performance of the company is going to be improved only if we can enhance the channel performance. So channel performance enhancement is one thing. And another benefit that we uh, look at or that we target the while we decide about the channels is that we must end up deciding uh, for something which offers competitive advantage to the company. So in other words, we can say that while we enhance the performance of the channels, we must also be able to gain some kind of competitive advantage. So measuring performance of channels rests upon three factors. One is the customer reach, the other is the operating efficiencies, and the third one is the service quality. If a company cannot reach its potential customers, it will not register sales, or it will register sales which are at a low level or a lower level and which automatically translates into lower profitability or maybe no profitability at all. If the cost to reach customers is very high, then the company is compromising its profitability again because the cost is very high. And the costs that uh, pertain to reaching customers are logistics, warehousing, inventory management, maybe returns also, and so on and so forth. If customers are not really satisfied with um, a service, meaning they don't like the way they are served in the marketplace, that is going to affect the performance of the channels. What does it mean by not being served well? Well, it could mean that the customers cannot really find your product here and there, meaning everywhere they want, meaning at the point of purchase of their preference. And it may also mean the kind of service they expect while you deliver your product, especially if it's a question of consumer durables. They may also not be satisfied with the way you offer services after sales have taken place. 
And that's what you call after-sales service. So in other words, these three factors are the ones which decide for the company to what extent the company is going to be cost efficient and customer effective through the channels it has decided to put in place. So I will repeat that cost efficiency and customer effectiveness are the two objectives which the company, any company has to attain while it is going through the process of deciding what kinds of channels it should have. And it is this cost efficiency and customer effectiveness which really decides whether a company should have direct channels or indirect channels. So in other words, the level of optimization, whether you achieve that through direct channels or through indirect channels, is going to decide what is the best possible way for you to deliver your products. And it also goes without saying that whatever is happening in the marketplace by competitors, meaning major players, is also something that you have to take into consideration. And following the market norm is not a bad practice. But that doesn't mean that you follow that without having to consider the strategic elements and all the considerations that I've been talking about. You must have very convincing answers to all the questions that we have raised so far or we've been discussing. And all those questions, in other words, have got to be considered in the light of all the strategic factors that are the point of discussion at the moment. Meaning, customer reach, costs, and customer service. These are the three strategic components for which any company must work in order to be effective in the marketplace. And these are the ones which lead any company to achieve what you may call cost efficiency and customer effectiveness. Cost efficiency and customer effectiveness lay the very basis or the foundation for the decision whether you should go for direct or indirect. Direct channels include direct sales, telemarketing, and e-marketing. Direct sales can take place in any form as long as goods are delivered directly. It has uh, an element of uh, telemarketing also because you receive calls and then on the basis of those calls could you get into action, something takes place on the operation side and then goods are delivered to the customers and so on and so forth. Telemarketing is very similar to what I've talked about and uh, e-marketing is something which is gaining popularity in the Western markets nowadays. And there are certain companies which are really huge and there are companies uh, which uh, specialize uh, only in e-marketing, whereas there are companies uh, which uh, have their own stores, meaning the traditional stores, and uh, alongside those, they are also engaged in uh, e-marketing. The interesting part of the whole thing is that um, the results they are uh, getting through the e-marketing are not cannibalizing their sales that are taking place on the store's side. So in other words, the e-marketing in most of the cases is adding to the traditional way of selling in those markets. Uh, what is the scope of e-marketing in our country is uh, a question that we have to consider very carefully and I'm going to talk about that a little later. Let's talk about indirect channels. Uh, you have distributors, then you have wholesalers, and then you have retailers. So in other words, indirect channels uh, consist of different layers and uh, all those layers play a very important function in their respective roles. Uh, why is it that uh, we have to have uh, so many layers of uh, the distribution before we reach the final consumer is again a question of customer reach and uh, then uh, the profitability and then the level of service. Uh, just look at the consumer consumables it is not really possible to start selling consumables which are beautifully branded um, to each and every customer all over the country um, if you start selling direct. 
you have to have um, specialized companies that, that play their respective roles could between could your production facilities and the points could where those items could, which happen to be convenience items are sold to ultimate consumers. Why do we have wholesalers? Because once we have distributors, um, it's again a question of customer reach. Maybe there are certain markets where you cannot really appoint very effective distributors because the markets are not big enough to optimize the operation on part of an independent distributor. And therefore, you may have to have a wholesaler who is uh, kind of uh, operating as uh, a distributor with the meaning selling to the retailers in that particular area who in turn are selling to the ultimate consumers. So these are the indirect channels uh, which uh, we generally have uh, for consumer consumables. And that is the case uh, almost all over the world. The next question is, how do we look at uh, the direct versus indirect in the context of operating efficiencies? Once uh, you have uh, decided that uh, you're going to go either direct or indirect, uh, naturally, the efficiency of operations takes the driver's seat. Meaning, if you're not very efficient in terms of your costs, then it is going to affect profitability of the company. So if you are engaged into direct selling and you think your costs are very high, I think that offers you an opportunity to look into alternatives. Just in order to decide that whatever you're doing has got to be optimized in terms of cost efficiencies. Because the objective remains that uh, the efficiency has not to be achieved at the cost of profitability. I mean, there is no point in uh, the selling uh, the very effectively or very efficiently the to your customers the while you're not making any profits at all or you're making very, very meager profits. And at the end of the day, you find out that the operation is not viable. There's no beauty of conducting that kind of an operation. Direct channels, although could offer could very high margins, could, but then do not forget that the responsibility of cost management and that of those channels rests with the company. Let me take you back to the direct selling of uh, the sandwiches. If you are delivering at the doorstep of your customers, or consumers for that matter, you may find out that your costs are very high. And they may be so high that you find them almost forbidding. And it is there that you may start considering getting into your own restaurants, where instead of selling to your customers by sending your delivery people, you actuate your customers to walk to your outlets, meaning restaurants, where you can sell them and you still sell them directly. There is no intermediary in between. So that is what I meant by cost efficiency. You, you still may remain direct, but you have to be very clear about the costs which are involved and the level of efficiency which you are wanting to achieve at a certain level of costs. So in other words, there has to be a balance between that cost efficiency and customer effectiveness. Both have got to be achieved and there should be an equilibrium between the two. E-marketing is uh, the fast becoming the norm in the Western markets like I pointed out earlier. And I also uh, pointed out that, uh, that there are many companies that are doing this kind of uh, the business, meaning uh, the ones that are following this kind of model in addition to their traditional stores. And they are quite very successful. But then there are companies that started as e-marketing companies. And those companies are into, for example, books. They are into selling, uh, you know, CDs and so on and so forth. Those companies in those markets have been very effective and also have been very cost efficient. They do not have any traditional stores. Now, this is not to say that they must also get into traditional stores. Again, the point of consideration for those companies is if they are very cost efficient 
And at the same time, they're also achieving customer effectiveness, meaning customers are satisfied and they remain loyal to that kind of buying, then there is no reason that why those companies should not further fortify that kind of business. The only question is what kind of brand extensions they should get into or what kind of range extensions they should get into. Those are the issues that we have been discussing in the previous lectures and just try to think of those in the context of your channels and the whole thing will become very interesting and very exciting for you. Potential of sales through e-marketing in our country is also, I would say, quite very high. But circumstances may not be very ripe at the moment for the lack of proper uh, the buying and selling regulations in relation to electronic buying and selling. That's what I'm saying. And uh, the fact that uh, not many, many people in this country have credit cards. Although the customer base of uh, credit cards is really multiplying exponentially, but still, you know, we have to go a long way before we start considering the e-marketing on a mass scale. This is not to say that we should uh, be inhibited um, into the going for the e-marketing. That is just to say that you've got to be very careful and uh, very prudent before you start considering uh, to venture into uh, that field. And I would say you still have an opportunity and a challenge to do something electronically uh, with the buy circumventing uh, with the meaning by getting into some other way of getting payments from your customers. Maybe you can open accounts with uh, the certain banks uh, where your customers can deposit money and uh, you use your delivery people or you use uh, the courier services in the country to deliver your products. This could be very exciting and challenging. But what do you think is a prerequisite? The prerequisite in this kind of a situation is that your product has got to have a very high level of differentiation. And if the promise your product or your brand for that matter carries is very different from uh, the ones uh, that are being offered by competition, then you have every chance to be successful. You are into e-marketing and you have a very interesting kind of uh, uh, the payment procedure uh, which uh, may not involve credit cards if uh, we think, I mean you and I think that uh, this, the situation is not really ripe to carry out transactions on the basis of credit cards. Indirect channels although offer lower margins but then the channel management uh, bears all the costs. The costs that you have to bear as a manufacturer are the margins that you dish out to the members of the channel. And those margins are not very huge if you're dealing in uh, consumer consumables in particular. The name of the game here is very high volumes. It goes without saying, if you are dealing into that kind of a product line, then you should register with very high levels of volumes because that is something which offers economies of scale. Other costs that you have to bear is transportation, the warehousing, and inventory management. But all those costs have got to be offset by the margins that you are gaining by selling very high volumes through the intermediaries that I've talked about, meaning distributors, the wholesalers, and retailers. So, this really uh, provides you with uh, a lot of uh, incisive insights uh, into uh, the option uh, whether you should go for direct or indirect channels. And uh, we have discussed uh, the indirect versus direct in the context of customer reach. The objective still remains. Do not make any mistake about that. The objective still remains that you've got to achieve cost efficiencies and customer effectiveness. There's got to be a balance between these two. The next component that uh, we are going to discuss relates a very high level of service quality that we've got to offer while we are considering whether we should go direct or indirect. 
Direct marketing assures a good level of service because you are selling direct and you have a direct interface with your customer. But it could be very expensive to maintain that kind of direct sales force. Let us go back to the example of the sandwiches. You may reach a point, like I told you earlier, where you start considering putting up your own restaurants only because maintaining the sales force is very expensive. Not only it is very expensive, operationally it also um, sags the efficiency of your uh, the people because they have to um, counter with so many different challenges in terms of traffic, in terms of time constraints, uh, in terms of uh, reaching difficult areas and so on and so forth. So in comparison uh, with uh, that kind of delivery, you might be forced to think about putting up your own um, outlets which will require a certain level of investment to begin with but then that level of investment has got to be offset by the volumes you're going to sell and in the hope that you are going to sell the very good volumes you should make a decision in favor of those outlets to cut your direct delivery costs again the objective is to maintain cost efficiency so you have to uh, weigh the, the pros and cons. If the one uh, system of uh, delivery offers certain advantages, uh, you should consider that. If that system becomes cumbersome uh, in terms of uh, operations or in terms of uh, costs, then you've got to consider the other one or maybe you've got to consider something which is in between. And that is why companies have a mix of uh, the different systems. If we remain focused on the fast food, uh, you still, I think, would like to maintain uh, your direct delivery up to a certain level. At the same time, you also would like to have uh, your own outlets. And that is the practice at the moment, not only in our country, but all over the world. You know, you have beautiful restaurants sitting here and there uh, over the city landscapes. And uh, you also have direct delivery people uh, who deliver uh, the food at uh, the ring of uh, a telephone. Do not forget to maintain the balance between cost efficiency and customer effectiveness. In direct marketing, in terms of a high level of service, offers certain disadvantages because it removes the company from the customer. There is no direct interface between the company and the customers. But then, if you're dealing in kind of a product which cannot be sold directly, or if it can be sold directly, it is not really practical and it entails very high costs, and you cannot go uh, and achieve uh, the kind of uh, customer reach which you must achieve, then there's no way that you can ignore this. What do you do in that kind of a situation? You've got to have a very strong CRM department. If you do not have a separate CRM department, you may assign this particular function to your salespeople. Traditionally, this function of uh, customer relationship management uh, was carried out and has been carried out by the salespeople. Sales managers traditionally have been the very good CRM managers. So, in other words, uh, we've got to make sure that we stay close to the customer, meaning we've got to make up for the deficiency which a system offers, meaning if the system uh, really puts us apart from the customer uh, only because it has to be that way, uh, then we've got to make sure that we have relationship management in place. And we've got to have certain means whereby we can reach our customers and uh, eliminate any gaps that may pop up uh, along the line in terms of communication and in terms of relationships. Another uh, disadvantage with which uh, the system of uh, the indirect channels uh, the offers is that companies are dependent upon so many different intermediaries who are dealing into so many different lines of products. It is not that uh, all the intermediaries who are related to your company are dealing only in your items. So in other words, their attention, their finances, and uh, 
their priorities are all divided among so many different products. I mean, if your brand happens to be the strongest among all the ones, you know, your uh, intermediaries are carrying, that is something else. But even then, they still have divided attention. So this is uh, one of the disadvantages uh, which this system offers, and uh, it becomes challenging for the companies, uh, for the brand managers, and also for the sales managers to look into this disadvantage and uh, to make it work um, in the favor of the companies. And you can do that through very good relationships with uh, different intermediaries and through very good monitoring you know, of uh, all the developments that are taking place in the market. It is because of that that salespeople are supposed to be in the market all the time. It is because of that that brand managers also have got to stay in touch with the marketplace uh, so that they also have their fingers on the pulse of the market. It is on the basis of a very practical kind of a feedback that you make better decisions. And which means staying close to the customer is the name of the game. Now, this doesn't mean that if you have direct channels, you may not be communicating with your consumers or customers, or you may not be developing a customer relationship management system. It doesn't mean that. But what it means is, um, under one set of circumstances, uh, one component and that takes on an added importance, the while under another set of circumstances, another component takes on uh, added importance. And it is for you to decide uh, what is more important where so that, again, you can maintain the balance between cost efficiencies and customer effectiveness. I keep repeating, these are the two things which you must not forget when it comes to channel management. The system of uh, the indirect channels, therefore, has uh, a built-in disadvantage in uh, not being as responsive as uh, the system of uh, direct channels is. And the reasons that we have discussed in, in quite very detail. It is uh, very interesting to note that uh, what may look like uh, the direct channels uh, also carries elements of uh, the indirect channels and vice versa. Uh, to give you one example, uh, your retailers uh, nowadays are offering uh, e-marketing to their uh, customers. Now, this is something which uh, may not be possible for those manufacturers uh, that are into uh, consumer consumables. Why? because you're dealing in just about with one product or with one product line. And it may not be very viable for your company to get into the e-marketing. Whereas by the time your product reaches uh, retailers, meaning when products of so many different manufacturers from all over the market reach uh, major customers who are wanting to get into the e-marketing, they really have a good chance to get into that because they have to offer a host of different items. I mean, they're going to offer you a complete basket okay, which you need for your households, which carries almost everything, which may not be the case with uh, the manufacturers. So what I'm talking about is that okay, from okay, your company right down to the retailer, it has been a case of indirect channel system. Whereas okay, from the retailer to consumer onward, it becomes very direct. Well, in a way, it was direct even before. But then, it is a way of uh, increasing sales. It is a way of uh, exercising another model, which still remains direct, but it is a different model, and it offers customers convenience. And this is the model which is being followed by the major of retailers, even in our market. This enhances the level of service. Because we are talking basically in the context of uh, enhancements of service level, that is why I'm talking about this model, because this does carry an element of a little stepped up service. You send your requirement either by telephone or by email, whatever the model is, whatever the way it works, you send your order and the next thing that happens is you get delivery of all the items that you wanted. 
So that I think is a terrific case of uh, a very high level of uh, service. So if it enhances the service this way, you may like to follow uh, this model. So this uh, is uh, the case of uh, what you might have learned, or rather what you must have learned in uh, some other course. And this is what you call uh, the B2C, meaning for business to customer or the business to consumer model. And this is uh, something which you may consider whenever you get into the practical field as a model uh, which is going to uh, supplement what the company has been doing traditionally. So in other words, whatever the system, meaning direct system of channels or indirect system of channels, the system has got to fulfill uh, the customer needs and yet it must be able to offer a high level of or a decent level of profitability to the company. So customer needs and profitability. And again, these two are translated into what I talked earlier, meaning customer effectiveness and cost efficiency. If you are cost efficient, you make better profits. If you are customer effective, you are fulfilling customers' needs in a very effective way. And that is what channel management is all about. We should be very clear by now whether we should be having a direct system of channels or an indirect one. After having made the decision about the nature of the system, that we should now make sure that the system offers a good value to customers and to the company as well. It builds value to the customer in three different ways. Number one, it uh, offers value through product benefits. Now, how does a system do that? A system does that by making sure that the product is delivered to the ultimate consumer the way it was promised. There should be no deviation from the promise, meaning the contract must not be broken while the product is delivered to the ultimate consumer. How do you do that? Or how does the system do that? That's a very interesting question. Let me try to explain that with the help of an example. Suppose you're dealing in um, frozen items. You've got to make sure that uh, the total line of logistics and the chain of supply is cold in nature, meaning at every point you've got to maintain the requisite temperatures, meaning very low temperatures, whatever the requirement is. And by the time the product reaches the retailer, it still has to have the same low temperature what is dictated by the company. Whether or not a retailer does it is a weighty question. You may be selling your product to a retailer who is one of the major players in the marketplace, but what if the retailer cannot maintain that temperature meaning if the retailer abuses the temperature and the customer, final consumer, gets something which is abused in terms of quality, what is going to be the result? A disgruntled and a dissatisfied customer. So that is something that you've got to make sure doesn't happen. And that is something which a good channel system ensures. If you take a look at different products, not only frozen products, the meaning ice cream or meat items or uh, even chilled items like uh, the packaged yogurt or uh, in certain cases um, packaged vegetables and so on and so forth. Uh, there are so many different products which you see in the marketplace nowadays all over the country uh, which have got to be uh, either chilled or uh, kept frozen with the help of refrigerators or freezers and whatever the case may be, it basically boils down to the effectiveness of the channel to what extent it delivers that product the way it is promised to be delivered. So in other words, if a product is a frozen product, it doesn't have to be announced since it is frozen 
it must come to you in a frozen way. I mean, that goes without saying. So it has to be a built-in feature of the channel system that the product is delivered the way it is to be delivered. And that ensures the service quality, that ensures the, the product quality, and that ensures so many different things the which uh, they translate into customer effectiveness. Inventory management is another way through which a good channel system can be very customer effective and also cost efficient. And that is how a good channel system adds value to the company and offers value to the customer. This is something that we have been talking about in so many different lectures all along the course that uh, in order to be uh, good professional the managers uh, in the present day's world, that your systems have got to be supported by the latest technology. And uh, inventory management nowadays is uh, all computer based, meaning information based. You've got to have the right information in place so that you can make your decisions in a timely manner, meaning your informational needs have got to be in a proper perspective for you to make the timely and rightmost decisions. If you do not know the quantity of expired items in one of your warehouses and those items escape the attention of the management there and find their way into the market and eventually into the hands of uh, the consumer, what is going to, be, going to happen? The consequences that can be guessed as well by you as by me. So this is one example of the good inventory management helping companies um, and helping um, uh, the channel systems uh, that develop the value for the company and for the customer. Inventory management nowadays is not taking place only at the company level. It is taking place at the level of distributors and it is taking place at the level of retailers. The fact of the matter is that uh, it is very, very important at the retail level because uh, the number of items that retailers are dealing in nowadays is astronomical. And therefore, their knowledge of uh, what they have and what they do not have, uh, what they have in reserve, and what is it that is lying in, ab in abundance, or you see, beyond the uh, required level of inventory is something which they must know because that affects order placing and order placing affects your production planning and it becomes kind of an, uh, an, an iterative uh, circle in which ev everyone moves and everyone has got to move in a smooth way with no hiccups, with no uh, breaks and so on and so forth. Uh, in other words, a good inventory management system is the backbone of uh, the supply chain management uh, which has taken on an added significance in present day's general management. If you have done the course on supply chain management, so much the better. If you have not done so, it is very important for you to understand the significance of that uh, area that because uh, Nowadays, production taking place remotely and brand management taking place at a different place, the need to coordinate the two areas of management has become much more important than it has been before. And I'm talking about this in reference to those with marketing companies that do not have their own production facilities and they outsource those things to other manufacturers. And this is something which you're going to study while you go through the course of international marketing. And I think there are certain marketing companies, even within our country, that uh, do not have their uh, production facilities and uh, the outsourcing is taking place as uh, a modern concept. And uh, given that concept, the, the management of the supply chain 
takes on an added significance, and that's what I'm saying. And given that kind of a setup, the importance of inventory management takes on added significance as well. That is my point. Regardless of um, the, the system, with the meaning whether it is direct or indirect, another thing which is very important for the system is imparting training and knowledge to your customers. If you are selling uh, the products about which uh, the information uh, giving and uh, the imparting of knowledge is uh, absolutely important, you've got to stay very close to your customer in imparting that knowledge. If you are selling uh, industrial equipment, for example, you've got to give all instructions to your customers because the machinery that you have sold may be very new and modern, which generally is the case, and you've got to impart total instructions uh, in their total relevance to all the people who are going to operate that machinery. This is how you build value through a good channel system. Another uh, factor is product assortment. A good channel system allows uh, itself to carry uh, all the products in terms of uh, the complete assortment. If you go back to the, uh, the brand extension uh, concept, uh, you will recall that uh, the products are uh, extended uh, by form, by format, by ingredients, by flavors, by tastes, and so on and so forth. So what I'm saying is that a good channel system has got to make sure that uh, the total product assortment is available and it is available all through the intermediaries, whether it is a direct channel or an indirect channel. If it is direct, well, you as a company has got to have complete assortment. And if it is indirect, all the intermediaries have got to carry all the assortments so that no customers and no consumers are disappointed. Disappointment means shifting to a competitive item. And that is something you have to keep your customers from doing. Because the good channel system has got to create a very good level of for the customer appeal. If a channel system cannot uh, create that kind of appeal, uh, the consequences again are understandable. And those are going to be quite very negative. No brand can afford to be missed out of uh, any retailers. Uh, because that diminishes the brand value. And uh, the diminished brand value is going to affect your customer value and uh, it is going to affect the value uh, which uh, it, it otherwise can offer to the company in a positive way. Uh, we have talked about um, the good channel system, uh, the offering or uh, rather the building value uh, for the customer and uh, for uh, the company uh, through products. Apart from products, a good channel system can also get the build value uh, for the company and also for the customers through offering services. Now, let us try to learn get how a good channel system can do that. And going back to the case of uh, the selling industrial products, you know the importance of uh, the after-sales services to which you offer after sales you know, have taken place. And in order to be able to do that, there are certain factors that you have to keep in mind. And those are that you've got to have trained staff. And those are that you've got to have the service centers. That you've got to have the complete technical support. And you've got to have a policy of the easy returns. Meaning if you have sold certain items which have not turned out to be up to the mark, the buy the customer's standards, that you've got to be prepared to receive those back at your service center at the end at the same time, could be able to replace that with another one which is free of any faults. So these are the basic factors which you have to make sure do exist before you start considering as to how the good channel system can build value uh, for the customer and also for the company. We have taken it for granted that uh, we must have uh, some uh, prerequisites in the form of uh, the training facilities, the training centers, and uh, the technical support. And once we have those, then we can offer uh, these services in two different ways. Uh, the one is the transaction services. 
Uh, these are the services which you offer while you are going through the process of sales. You've got to make uh, it easy for the customer to be able to make the decision as quickly as possible. In other words, if you are selling a product for which you know, a customer has to um, study and then analyze and then make comparisons with uh, the competitive items, it is your duty, meaning it is the job of the uh, channel member who is doing selling at any given point in time to make sure that uh, the customer makes uh, the, the final decision as soon as possible. And that is possible only if you can give the customer the right most information and if you can convince the, the customer about the service uh, which you can offer at that particular point in time. Uh, the, for example, if somebody has come to you to buy a refrigerator or an air conditioner and uh, you are part of the total market you know, which is uh, selling all these items, the customer can just go next door, peep in, and get to talk with uh, the other retailer uh, to for some other brand. So you've got to make sure that uh, before the customer starts thinking on those lines, you give the customer so much comprehensive information and the kind of service that uh, the customer um, is not uh, actuated to go elsewhere. So that is the, the transaction service which you have to uh, think of uh, while uh, um, making your sales. Other examples that I would expect you to uh, think of uh, in relation to transaction services. But well, uh, the one could be delivery. You know, if somebody has uh, bought an item, uh, transporting which is a hassle, you can offer you know, that kind of service. And uh, if you offer that service as uh, the part of a company policy, uh, the word spreads around and uh, you're known for that kind of a transaction service. The other service which you can offer uh, or which you do offer always and you have to offer is the after-sales service. And uh, the after-sales service uh, is very comprehensive, starting with uh, the 3S the system with which we have been talking about in here and there in relation to brand management. Whether you've got to make sure that uh, the spare parts are available. You've got to make uh, sure that um, the service centers are uh, in shape uh, for you to offer the right most services. And uh, you've got to make sure uh, that um, the technical support is in place. So in other words, it is the combination of all these services which uh, offer value to the customer and by the time you have delivered this service, a customer must feel satisfied and they must have the realization that uh, uh, the customer has gained a certain level of good value. Each of the benefits, the meaning uh, either through you know, products or through services, it has its own benefits. The important thing is where you are selling products which are to be accompanied by services, the combination of the product and the service has got to be the most optimal. You may be selling a product which is of very high quality and which really is much better than the ones being sold by your competition. But if you're not offering the requisite service which must accompany that product, whether a transaction service or a after-sales service, uh, your product may not sell as well as competition. Despite the fact that competition is not as good as you are. So in other words, the, just the quality of the product is not uh, a guarantee to a very strong competitive position. The product has got to be accompanied by the requisite service. That's the lesson. And uh, that is the way that you would build up through a good channel system with a value for the customer and also for the company. The fact is that uh, the emergence of uh, service centers uh, by so many companies that uh, offer a combination of uh, products and services is a testimony uh, to the realization on part of the companies that, uh, that this aspect of uh, the marketing, meaning uh, coupling uh, service with products is so very important that without this the coupling, 
but we just cannot succeed in the marketplace and we just cannot have the competitive advantage, meaning the kind of competitive advantage which we must sustain in order to remain successful in the marketplace. So that is the lesson for today and uh, that is all for the channels in terms of uh, what kind of channels we should have, what are the strategic considerations for the rightmost channel system and how a good channel system uh, that builds value for the company and offers value to the customer because uh, we must not forget that brand management is all about customers and the companies. And uh, these are the two the basic components uh, the way around which brand management revolves. So much for today and uh, we're going to uh, pick up the threads from where we are leaving today. The topic of uh, the channel management has not come to an end yet and uh, I will be talking about channel management a little more, a little more in the next uh, lecture. Allah Hafiz, until then.